Lord, thank you for teaching us about brokenness and help us to remember always that it's the breaking of us that makes us a fit vessel for you. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us for our arrogance. Forgive us for our complacency, for not having a daily attitude of brokenness. Jesus, forgive us. You are worthy, and there in us dwells no good thing. But it is by your mercy and love and forgiveness that draws us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quick, Proverbs 25. I know that was a little lengthy, but um, drives home the point of what the Lord is doing. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of talk in the Christian realm, things that we've seen, but it's I think it was all ordained by God to bring us to the spot to sift out that which is not of him as if to say as if God is saying who will still hang on to me they're the ones that God will draw to his presence verse 4 Proverbs 25 remove impurities from silver and a vessel will be produced for silversmith I'm reading from the HCSB remove the wicked from the king's presence and his throne will be established in righteousness. Two things. The word impurities is dross. I don't know how much you guys know about metalworking or metallurgy. When you have like iron comes in a rock, but there's iron in it or gold or silver. There's a lot of impurities, a lot of, I'm going to say 99.2% pure. There is the way you get there is fire, a very hot fire that makes the metal liquid, moldable, pliable, castable. It takes the rock and it just comes off. It cannot stand in its presence. It literally rises to the top so there can be like a spoon or some, some sort of item to like sort of pour off the top almost like in soup you have like a scum that goes to the top same thing do you understand you have scum in you and that's called flesh so long as we have in this body the impurity is that silver is is the is in in the old testament is always redemption remove that and a vessel will be produced. Now the word in the Hebrew for, um, or literally says will come out. Same word used, oh I put this gold in and out came this calf. It's the same word. A silversmith. The word there is saraf, which literally means a burner, a refiner, a smelter. The last verse of Hebrews 13, for our God is a consuming fire. You can't stand in His presence without getting burned. Which begs the question, have you been in his presence? Have you allowed him to burn you? Have you allowed have you allowed him to search you and say, son, you got this in you? And you say, okay, take it. Take it. Mold me. Burn me. This verse 5 is connected to that same impurities. It says, remove the wicked from the king's presence. Okay, sounds like a great verse. The Lord showed this to me. And his throne will be established in righteousness. The wicked, in the Hebrew sense, throughout the Psalms, I'm going to throw something at you. The wicked is not those who prostitutes, pimps, drug dealers. They're the ones that say, oh, I'm good. They think that because they are churchgoers, well-meaning people, I'm not pointing out anybody. I was there. And yet, 
they are unapproachable. They don't bend down to those who are quote unquote what what society deems low lives or stretch out their hands to the untouchables. I don't want to be in that company. Or the ones that Leanne's been reading about Ann Voskamp, how Ann had a experience where the pastor was living next door to a loony bin and everybody laughed. What he didn't realize was Ann's mom, because of a personal trauma, they, her sister died. She watched her sister get run over by delivery truck, pure accident. And the mom was never the same and was in a mental, mental institution. Hebrews 12 says, therefore, let us go outside the camp and bear the reproaches of Christ with him. God sees on the cross. You want to know what God thinks of you? Now there's the inside you as a soul versus you and your strength in your flesh and your ability. Look at the cross. Let's face it. The Lord showed us the other, uh, yesterday, Jesus never got a potty break. Mm. Do you know how humiliating it is? You can't control your bladder. You can't control your bowels. And you soil yourself. You're a spectacle. It's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. You're hungry, you're thirsty, you're being laughed at to begin with. And then you can't control your bodily functions and you're being laughed at. That's what God sees of it. You are wallowing in your filth. He says, I hate it, but I want your heart. And I want that. And I want it. But there's all of that and Jesus in his flesh. That had to happen. To get to where you are, to who you are. Remove the wicked. I can manage my life without God. Those who swear by God's name falsely in the Psalms is the wicked. Oh, I'm a Christian, but you're not doing what God's telling you to do. Oh, well, I don't want to have to act in faith. And oh, that's too hard for me. Or You have just committed wickedness because you didn't do what you were told. Do you believe Jesus is your Lord? Do you know that the Bible says in the book of Acts, is it Acts? 7,000 times he's referenced as Lord, 37 as Savior. If he's Lord, that means he owns you. He's your master. I'm sorry? 7,700 times in, in, in the scriptures. He is Lord. God has made him both Lord and Savior, not just Savior. Savior means, oh, yes, we, yeah, thank you, Jesus. And then you go along your merry way. Well, I'm thinking about doing this job. And Have you asked your maker? Do you understand? Not only does he have a say in it, that's his plan. And if you are making one step without consulting him, that's wickedness. Do you understand? You are in the king's presence and he will have none of it because now his throne is not established in righteousness because of you, because of me. Because of our own self-sufficiency. And it says, remove it. And God's throne. And we constantly say our heart is the throne of God. Wilkerson says, if you have 5%, 10% Antichrist sitting on the throne of your heart, you have the Antichrist in your heart, period. You need to have all of Jesus Christ in your heart. And his throne will be established in righteousness. Guys, be broken. I put out a video um, earlier in the week. I really felt it was the Lord, and it was an experience for me where I had to be broken, saying that about the election. Um, I don't want this, this sermon censored, so I have to be careful what I say because I want the message of Jesus to go out. But I made the prophecy about it and it didn't come to pass and i watched a message of another dear brother who quoted first john 4 test every spirit and immediately god said you're the man 
I held my head in shame, leading my children to sin because they trusted me. Leading y'all who are listening to me to a false hope. And I'm sorry. And God said, you were not testing every spirit. He gave me the, the verses of Ephesians 5. Encourage one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Not prophecies. If God gives you a word for a specific person, the purpose of, this is side note, of prophecy is to build up the body. And that's where I failed. It was all ordained of the Lord, where there was wickedness dwelling within me. God said, I'll have none of it. But then we sang a song. Oh, I will make room for you. Now God can have his way. Now God can fill you with his glory. Now God can use you for his kingdom. You, he cannot use you if you have any ounce of strength, any ounce of flesh, any ounce of anything of yourself. He can't. He won't. He says, I'm not going to dwell with filth. By Christ being emptied of his life on the cross. Now God says, now I'm able to fill the world. What does it say in Joel 2? I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That can't happen if someone doesn't take the penalty of Adam's sin. And that was Jesus Christ. He did. Now the spirit is poured out. Now greater things you will do. It is afforded to us that now Jesus can dwell in us by his Holy Spirit. Baptized. And walking. And it's not just that. Secure. Knowing that this realm. When you have brokenness. Don't. Shy from it. But no. It is an eternal. Training ground. For you and for me. Because what we see. Is a wasteland. It's a shadow land. It's a titanic. It's sinking. He's training you for eternity. And the longer you live here, battling the illusion of death, or shall we say the shadow of death, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, death is an illusion. The shadow of death causes more fear than death itself. If you got hit by a car and decapitated your head at that moment, you wouldn't know that it happened. Just like, ow! I got my thumb cut on a table saw. Didn't know it happened. I went to go push a stick down and went, zip! I was like, ah, it was a pinch. It was a pinch. And looking at it, I'm like, oh man, that's my bone. It was a pinch. I didn't even know I got cut. I just thought I got pinched. It was that fast. But the fear of getting cut by a table saw when I was a young apprentice in the, carpent in the carpenters, oh man, was that dreadful. That was dreadful. Getting cut by the saw was nothing. By the same token, if God breaks you, guys, don't be afraid of correction. Don't be afraid of reproof. Take it as from the Lord. Every reproof is from the Lord. The Lord is reproving you because he, you are his son. And as a son, he loves you. and He'll discipline you quickly because he, he wants to stop you from making a mess to his eternal plan. If he doesn't, let me, let me, the fact that you're getting reproved, rejoice, saying, oh, Jesus, thank you so much, because you are proving your fathership to me. If he doesn't reprove you, I would be on my face. Oh, God, am I your son? I'm not being reproved. I know I'm doing something's not right here. And God's allowing you. Rejoice when you are reproved. Rejoice because now God has a vessel for you. A vessel for him, excuse me. A fit vessel. His best. And he will not settle for anything less than his perfection. Not yours. You mean nothing but a pot to hold his light where you are. In your work. In your home. In your family. Say, I'm sorry. I messed up. No excuses. None. Not, well, I, I should apologize. I, I need to, yeah. No, stop it. Stop it. 
Own it. You got egg on your face. You stepped in dog do. I'm sorry. I messed up. Do you forgive me? Because the more you show your need for Jesus, the more he shows up and he shows you how much he loves you. The more he shows up and he says, oh, and I died for it too. And you see the cross and experience the resurrection in your life because you know, God, thank you. You saved my life in here. Oh, guys, rejoice. Rejoice. Did you, you want to say something? Hebrews 12. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin that we so easily fall into. And then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. For the path has already been marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm and we face in our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. Verse 5, my child, do not underestimate the value of the discipline and the training of the Lord God or get depressed when he has to correct you. For the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. And when he draws you to himself, it proves you are his delightful child. Fully embrace God's correction as part of your training. Verse 8, we should welcome God's discipline as the validation of authentic sonship. Verse 9, we should demonstrate an even greater respect for God, our spiritual father, as we submit to his life-giving discipline. But God corrects us throughout our lives for our own good, giving us an invitation to share in his holiness or set-apartness. And we know that discipline seems to be more painful than pleasure at the time, and yet it will later produce a transformation of character bringing a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who yield to it. Verse 12, be made strong even in your weakness by the lifting up of your tired hands in prayer and worship and strengthen your weak knees as you keep walking forward on God's path. All of your stumbling ways will be divinely healed. In every relationship, be swift to choose peace over competition. Run swiftly towards holiness. Watch over each other and make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace. And let no one live with a root of bitterness sprouting up within them, which will only cause trouble and poison the hearts of many. For, in verse 22, we have already come near to God in a totally different realm, the Zion realm, where we have entered the city of the living God, which is the new Jerusalem in heaven. And we have joined the festal gathering of the myriads of angels in their joyous celebration, being legally registered as citizens of heaven and made perfect in God's eyes by the new covenant through Christ, blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat, blood that continues to speak from heaven, forgiveness, a much better word than Abel's blood, which cried justice. And at the end there, verse 20, oh, I can't read that number. That's what happens when you get old. Whatever number that is, 28. 28, yeah. Since we are receiving our rights to an unshakable kingdom, we should be extremely thankful and offer God the purest worship that delights his heart as we lay down our lives in absolute surrender, filled with awe, for our God is a holy, devouring fire. Hallelujah. It is our pride that divides us from God. Yep. And this is the other part of brokenness. You can't be broken and proud at the same time. You can't hold on to your dignity and be broken at the same time. There is brokenness that happens because of our personal sin and failure. And there's brokenness that happens because we live in a sinful world. And it's not related to a personal failure or sin. And both must be embraced. The fact that we suffer in this earth because it is sin-stained is, is part of our identification with Christ. The whole revelation of, of 
Christ and his the the lack of dignity that he had and experienced in the cross. I mean, I've thought of him being stripped of his clothes before, but I never thought of what happened in the hours and hours and hours that he was on that cross when he had to go to the bathroom. I didn't think of that until I found myself in a very humiliating place because of a brain tumor that has caused me to not be able to control my own bodily functions. And as I wept, feeling utterly humiliated, I thought of my Jesus there, King of kings and Lord of lords, suffering the same indignity because of a sin-stained world. And he was willing to suffer that for me. And he didn't look at me in disgust, in my physical weakness. And he didn't push me off and say, no, you're a filthy thing. But he came to me and he said, you're participating in my sufferings. Oh, God. Nor is he ashamed of our sin. He knows it. And he willfully bears it for us. And yet we hold so hard onto our dignity. We don't want to be ashamed. We're so afraid of being vulnerable, naked and exposed. The same book of Hebrews tells us that everyone is naked and exposed before him. It's a lie to think that you can somehow hold it together. And we would feel so much better if we just own up to our plight. The fact that we mess up and the fact that we live in a sin-stained world. And that we need help. One of the greatest sins, I think, in this society is self-sufficiency pride. You know, it's one of the things that God says he's an enemy of. I oppose the proud. He is an enemy to those who cherish pride and try to hold it together in their heart. But I give grace to the humble, a broken and a contrite heart I will not despise. Don't ever be afraid of humiliation. Because that's what breaks up the fallow ground for the word of God to come in. Mm, for the amen. love of God to warm your heart. Amen. It was in his very brokenness on the cross that we find communion. This is my body. What? Broken for you. Broken. Mm. He gave thanks and he broke and he gave of himself so that we can participate with him. And when we are honest and real before God, we can receive healing. But there's another thing. When we are honest and real and broken before one another, we can experience deep communion with each other. Because now I don't have to put on a face before you. I can be honest with you and you can be honest with me and we can have real relationship, not Sunday morning. Hi, how are you doing? Everything's fine. Glad everything's going great with you relationship. And you guys know it. We've all done it because we didn't want to get into the real mess of our life, but then we don't really share and we are to be known by our love for one another. What is that? That's not warm squishies. Jesus' love was demonstrated to us by his laying down of his life for us. That's the kind of love that we are to have for one another. Amen, amen. One that gives and gives and is sorrowful with and bears up the burdens of one another. Amen. And that's willing to 
to come alongside and weep and mourn and lift up in prayer. That's the kind of love. Oof, Jesus. It's Hallelujah. not squishiness. It's not warm affection. It's deep. And you can't have that kind of love if you can't be open with one another. Which means it's an investment. Being willing to lose knowing they may turn on you. Look at Jesus. How many have turned on him? He knew what was in their heart, but he gave anyway. How much more so? We don't know what's in people's hearts. Ought we, like the Savior, like the Lord, I do what I see my father do. He was on the cross. The creator gave of himself, knowing full well Adam would sin and disobey. But he still pours out his grace. He still pours out, out his love. He's not, a, he's not unholy. He's not untrue. He's very much true and holy. But he's also gracious and lets us live. And says, I'll provide a redeemer. Even when they would have fouled it, everything up. This is what I'm going to do. And demonstrated it by the full measure of wrath on his son on the cross for us. Guys, 1 Corinthians 11. 1. Let's do what the Bible says. Imitate me, Paul says, as I imitate Jesus. Amen. Don't be afraid of pouring out your heart. I'm not talking about emotional prostitution. Going down the street, hi, I'm a, I was a sex addict and Jesus healed me. Hi, I, I you know, shot up every week. I'm not saying that. I don't know, maybe that would be necessary to wake us up. But what I am saying, ask the Lord, Lord, how would you use this vessel? We saying, here's my heart. It means he could do with it whatever he wants. If he says, go talk to that person, even though that person is just spewing every manner of filth at you. It's not about you. It's about him. And even if you get slapped, yelled at, rejected, mocked, ridiculed, or even shunned, just politely not returning your calls. Or just, oh, I, uh, I, I can't talk right now. I, uh, I'm washing my hair. Or just giving an excuse. Don't take it personally. Rejoice. Say thank you, Jesus. Give anyway, Jesus did. Yes, give where Jesus did. And say, thank you, Jesus, you gave me an opportunity to serve. The only words that should come out of our mouths is, we are unprofitable servants. We were only doing what we were told. Amen. It's time to get there. Father, let us pray. Let us worship, O oh God. Jesus, bring us back to brokenness, broken vessels. Holy God, use us. Abba, I'm sorry where we want to hold on. Abba, release our grip. We can't even see it. In your light do we see light. In you, Jesus. The veil is set aside. Help us once again, always, to walk. If someone gives us a correction, to say, in faith, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm actually a lot worse than you describe. If someone says, you know, you really screwed that up, Abba, help us to say, you know, I probably screwed it up a lot worse than you say. And I need a savior. Oh God, let us, God, forgive us for thinking too highly of ourselves. Because you tell us in Proverbs not to, that it is better to say, for someone to say of us, come up here 
as we take a lowly spot rather than us take a high spot and being brought down to shame. Oh, have mercy upon our, uh, upon us, O oh Lord. Help us to be take the role of of servants on our faces, Abba, to receive correction when someone says, "You know, you really," and they just land blast us to say, "You know, I really deserve it. I do. I need prayer." Oh God, let us be real with one another. To say, I really messed up and I need grace. Let us be the community, oh Jesus, that give from our storehouse. Because the grace that you've given us is the storehouse by which we give. If someone comes to us and says, I need grace. Because that's, what, oh God, that's what we need. We need grace. We need grace. We don't need judgment. We need grace. <laughs> oh Jesus, we need grace. Oh God! Oh God, we need mercy! Oh God, we need forgiveness! Oh God, we need your tender face, oh Jesus! Oh God, let us always seek grace, knowing that you're, you are true, and you are holy, and you are right, and you deserve every judgment that you pour out! And yeah, everything was right and true and we can only say amen it was right because we deserve even far more than what we have received. Let us only plead the blood of Jesus which gives us the grace that is everlasting, oh God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Jesus. Praise you. God, help us to cry once again. Oh God, I know there are people that are so hardened. They haven't cried in years. Not that we make ourselves cry, but that you touch the very bottom of our heart that pierces us to the point of tears. Oh God, we Americans don't cry. Let us be on the forefront of that in, uh, internal caring in Jesus name Amen Amen